greetings everyone welcome to the 163rd session of the online optom learning series and ols uh, and for today's session i'm very happy privileged and proud to have with us uh, uh, dr donald ezekiel uh, i would say dr don uh, because everybody knows him and loves him by this name with over vast experience of over four decades he is one of the most experienced uh, lecturer or presenter we have on to this ols platform but just to give you a brief about sir uh, he finished his uh, diploma in optometry and then he also holds a fellowship from the american academy of optometry a couple of other associations and fellowships to his credit he has over four decades more than experience in terms of uh, practicing optometrists in australia in western australia to be more precise uh, he is a founding fellow of the contact lens society of australia and also an honorary fellow life member of the international society of contact lens specialists his journey began when he started working with a contact lens pioneer dr joseph delos and where he started learning about contact lenses which you know initiated all these thoughts about what his work is all about today and he's inclined his practice towards clearer lenses uh, wrote many book chapters publications and taught a lot of people throughout the globe how to fit scleral lenses what are scleral lenses all about and he is also been awarded by the australian government for recognizes his contribution to contact lenses and in 1999 he was awarded the australia's third highest award as the member of order of australia's am he is also at the board of directors for the contact lens museum where we were just discussing that sir has been very kind in donating a lot of uh, materials for that museum and uh, some of it he mentioned that it's still functional so how careful i think he has been you, you know keeping those things into uh, practice and using them and today he's with us going to share about fenestrated gas permeable scleral lenses which one is a better option and he's going to share his experience throughout all his journey so welcome sir on to this platform and let me leave the screen time to you thank you very much and uh, thank you for inviting me that's very good nice of you um i live in western australia right down here on the left hand corner we're actually in the most isolated city in the world which is a disadvantage but it has its advantages because um if i have a patient come in and i don't know what to do with him i've got no one to ask so i have to sit down and work it out and that's not so difficult well you know everything is if you work from basics it's it's easy enough to do now if i just go to square lenses this is a a a, sli a slide from bob keating he is a very famous american optometrist and in 1981 i think he was the editor of contacto that was a very prominent contact lens journal at the time and the results of a survey which he 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 instituted was that he asked the 10 contact lens practitioners contact lenses practitioners don't want to know about and the lens at top of the list was the haptical scleral lens and that's no surprise because as in my travels uh, when I was I used to do workshops around the world teaching people how to fit scleral lenses uh, I did a I had a prime time one hour at the American Academy of, of Optometry and uh, where I spoke about scleral lenses and, and showed them how to fit them uh, I think there was just three or four people that followed it through it was just too difficult but maybe in America that's how they work you know it's a they want a quick fix and scleral lenses often takes a little bit more time so this is how the gas permeable lens evolved I was introduced to scleral lenses by my pathology lecturer an ophthalmologist called um, Ken Barton Brown and Ken had actually worked in London and and uh, strangely enough or interesting enough he worked with Joseph Dallas who I suddenly worked with and in his lectures he always alluded to the benefits and the great use of, of scleral lenses a scleral lens he could fit 
and people could see. And that was the only option they had. And that probably introduced me to uh, my first introduction to squirrel lenses. My father was an optometrist, and he was always emphasized to me that the world's changing and this, the, the world of a, of a specialist is very important. So if one could get a specialty, then you would be very successful. So th I guess this is my first introduction. Now, um, I'll just go back, back a step. Um, 1967, I was very fortunate to work. Uh, I went to London, I got married, and I went to London with my new bride four days later, and uh, I, did, I went to get experience in contact lenses. I, I had uh, in, in Perth, I went to the East Coast, and I spent a month with a very prominent practitioner, Lloyd Hewitt, uh, who taught me how he fitted squirrel lenses. But then I went to London, and I went to a city, the, the Northampton, Northampton Polytechnic, now the City University, and Bob Fletcher was the head of the contact lens department then. And I, I fronted up and said, you know, I'd like to do your contact lens course. And uh, he said, well, it's booked out for the next few years. We only have 12 people there, but you can be number 13. And he was very, very good to me. Um, I also had introductions to Moorfields Eye Hospital because I was doing honorary work at, at the Royal Perth Hospital, the major hospital in Perth. And I had introductions to Moorfields. And they were very good to me. The guy who was running it was um, very prominent in the interocular lens department, but he was running the contact lens clinic. And he just said, go down the clinic and enjoy it. And it was fascinating. Sorry. It was, it was fascinating because I saw pathology that I'd read about, never seen again. And the other interesting thing there was I was in England at the right time. Um, contact lenses were evolving. Uh, Montague Rubin was a registrar who became the head of the department, who I knew well, became a good friend. Um, the top people, I think, in the evolution of contact lens were there. Norman Bear was the, uh, had the best contact lens practice in London. Uh, Montague Rubin, I've mentioned. Philip Cordrain and um, David Clulo owned contact lens manufacturing, which became Sorflon. Uh, and they had a fascinating setup there. They were ahead of their time. Everyone else was using HEMA, but they were using high water contact lenses. Um, and George Nissel uh, was making equipment. So um, I, I, I knew all these people and um, I was fortunate that I, I managed to get a job uh, for Joseph Delos. Now, Delos was the first, he and Norman B at the same time described fenestration because uh, prior to fenestrating a lens, Patients could wear a squirrel lens for that four hours. Um, oxygen dep deprivation would come in, satellite veiling, and that's all they could wear it through. But they well, they described how to get um, like by fenestrating a lens could be worn all day. Uh, interesting enough, um, I, I really think someone up there is pulling strings because when I thought I should go and get some practice in a in a um, in a practice, I went down Harley Street, and for some reason I went down. You kept to left in New Cavendish Street. I don't know why. And there was a, 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 a optical business called Hamlin's. So I went in there and said, you know, you need me. I've done, I fitted corneal squirrels. And the guy said, well, we don't do the contact lenses here. Opposite is our contact lens department. And a guy there called Joseph Dallas runs it. Very difficult to work with, you know. It's very hard to work with him. So I went in there and... Um, we got on perfectly. Uh, I told him what I'd done. <laughs> he, turned, he said to me, you don't know anything, I'll teach you. And so he offered me a job. So I thought this is a bit interesting, too easy. So I rang Bob Fletcher at the university who I'd done the course with and said, who is this guy? And Bob said, just get your, your uh, contact lens uh, book out and look at the first page. And there was Joseph Dallas. And he, among... He was the first one to take an impression of an eye, the first one to, was with Norman Beer to fenestrate. And I sat with uh, Joseph Dallas and said, how did you work that out? And he said, well, he, when you fit a squirrel in, you put it on the eye and you push hard or push firmly, and any area of blanching, you grind away. 
this was he was fitting only glass lenses. And he was grinding away this area of, of, of contact and he made a hole in the lens. Um, it takes a little while to make a, a glass lens. So he polished the hole, uh, apologized to the patient and said, um, we've got to make a new lens. This hopefully will tide you over. Uh, come back in uh, on Friday in a week and I'll get you a new lens. The guy didn't turn up for three months. And when he came in, Dallas said, what's going on? Where have you been? He said, well, I didn't come back because I was wearing it all the time. So Dallas said to me, then all we had to do was work out whether, where to put the fenestration. Now, he was very, very interesting, Dallas. Um, and I was sitting, um, I came back to Perth and I started fitting, I was fitting scleral lenses. And uh, there were ophthalmologists in Perth who were trained in the UK and they were familiar with the benefits of a scleral lens. And patients referred, were referred just to scleral lenses. And the head of the children's hospital was uh, an ophthalmologist, an ophthalmologist uh, Mary Bremner, and she would ring me up probably once a week, sometimes more often, and say, I've just taken a cataract out of this, this baby's eye, four weeks or around that age. We're going to anesthetize the baby uh, on Friday. I want you to come in at 10 o'clock and take a, and fit a contact lens to it, a scleral lens to it. So I'd go to the hospital, gown up, the baby would anesthetize, but when the eye closes, the eye rolls up, Bill's phenomenon. So I'd take an impression of the eye and I'd get a, a little bit of cornea, but maybe the lower canthus. So it was really very difficult because it's, you know, it was hard enough when you take a good impression to fit, you then have to modify it. But with a baby, I didn't have very little cornea to go on. So it was very difficult. So these little babies, and they actually, what is what spurred me on. Now, there just had to be a better way. It had to be easier for the practitioner, certainly for the patients, and certainly for the patient's parents, because they had to insert the lens. Uh, uh, sorry, I'll go back one. Uh, there's got to be an easier way to, to do this. Now, I had a, a small contact lens laboratory, which was great, because I could do anything and I could make anything, sort of. Well, I had a good technician doing it. Um, but we're fitting all our corneal lenses with gas perma materials. No one is using Perspex, PMA anymore. We're all using gas perm materials. So why not with, why not with spiral patients? So I, we were buying lens materials from Polymer Technology in Boston. So I hopped on a plane, flew to Boston, and I sat with the owners of the then owners of Polymer Technology. Polymer Technology. One was Perry Rosenthal. Perry was the senior ophthalmologist at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Hospital, fitting contact lenses. And the other one was Lou Major, who was running the laboratory. And I said, um, you know, I'd like to have, <laughs> sorry, I've gone too far. Uh, I'd, I really would like some um, large blanks to make my scleral lenses. And Perry, he was the senior ophthalmologist at the contact lens clinic, said, why do you want those? No one fits scleral lenses anymore. And I said, you know, that's not so. Um, it's a needed lens. I've got a busy practice fitting scleral lenses, and the people I'm fitting them to are patients that don't have any choice. Without a scleral lens, they don't see. They don't get vision. They don't get comfort. And this maybe make it easier. Um, eventually, Lou Major, who ran it, ran the, the, the manufacturing, said, I'll send you some material. I went back to Perth. Nothing happened. And without exaggeration, at least two, twice a week, maybe three times a week, I sent him a telex saying, where are my lenses? And Lou eventually said to me, uh, uh, I saw him later and he said, oh, he had this pile of telexes on his desk from this character down in Australia. Um, so I thought I'd better make him some um, get, uh, large buttons. When I show, look at the a video in a moment, you'll see a rod of the gas per material. Um, he just sent me rods of it. They cast the material in a rod and then they normally cut them up and sell a blank. Um, I think he just made, well, they just made a rod and sent it to me, the first large rod. And really making it in, in um, a scleral lens in, uh, in a gas material is not, not, not the rocket science. Anyway, cutting myself short, there Perry said, 
And now, I fitted, I initially fitted, refitted PMMA patients, successful PMMA, PMMA patients with a gas flow material. And the results were, were, were uh, I presented at, a contact, uh, a, at the British Contact Lens Society annual meeting in 1967. Um, in 98, sorry, 1987, 1983. And interestingly, the write-up in the optician said no one believed it. The lens is going to be so thick, you're not going to get enough oxygen through. Now, it happened that I, I was a member of the International Society of Contact Lens Specialists, so uh, I actually showed the video, which I'll show you in a moment, on how I filled a uh, gas perm scleral lens, penetrated. And um, uh, Irving Fat was the guru, was the, the most important person as far as oxygen transmission through, through materials, the decay of materials. And he came, he came to me afterwards and said, uh, you're obviously getting results. Send me details of the lens. Give me the, the thicknesses and I'll do the calculation. And uh, he came back saying the, the eye gets five, ten, five times more oxygen than the, than the cornea needs. All that correspondence is in the Contact Lens Museum. Um, it's quite historical. It's really quite good. Um, the conclusion of the paper, I thought, was very interesting, particularly at, what, 35 or so, so years later, was that the gas, and per gas permeable haptic lens is advanced for the haptic patients, the haptic lens practitioner and his patient. For the practitioner, the lens is very much easier and quicker to fit. For the patient, the lens appears to be a more comfortable and acceptable lens than the PMA haptic lens. These factors suggest that the haptic lens could once again be more readily available for patients for whom it remains the lens of choice. So that was, it turns out, that was quite, quite true. Now, um, this is a letter, part of a letter I got from um, uh, Roger Buckley. Roger uh, uh, um, was the, took over from, from um, uh, the, the head of the contact lens department at Moorfields Eye Hospital, and his, his comment was, my view, view of the scleral contact lens is that it is the medical contact lens par excellence. There is no eye shape that cannot be fitted with this type of lens. Now, I agree with him. You know, um, you can fit anyone with one of these lenses, and uh, it's really not that difficult to do. So um, this is the program. This is the... When I had read, uh, when the paper was published, a lot of practices around the world contacted me and were interested. And but then they'd come back and say, "We've done this. What do we do next?" So I put forward this, uh, put together this video, which is the way I fit the contact lens. Um, it, it's it, this. If you go back, this is in. This goes back to 1983. So this was this video was probably done. A year later. So that's a long time ago. Things have improved and things have changed. But um, this is, I think this may be of interesting interest how in the old days we finished it. It's going to be very different today. The scleral lens is the only lens option for patients who must wear a rigid contact lens but cannot tolerate a corneal lens and for those pathological cases where a rigid, stable lens is necessary. In the past, scleral lenses were made of glass and PMMA. These lenses are time-consuming and difficult for the practitioner to fit and for the patient to adapt to. As a consequence, the scleral lens has become a lens that has been generally overlooked as an optical aid that is readily available for the patient when it is often the only optical aid that could be used to give effective optimal vision. The development of the gas permeable materials and the application of these materials for the scleral lens has resulted in the development of a simplified fitting procedure for the practitioner and a comfortable and readily adaptable lens for the patient. The advantages that scleral lenses offer over other lenses are well documented. Ocular conditions best suited are advanced keratoconus, particularly those with a decentered cone, high irregular cornea as a result of trauma, 
corneal grafts that have very marked irregular astigmatism, numerous pathological eyes, corneas which are disrupted, distorted or dry due to lid deformities may be protected with scleral lenses. Photosis or palsy, a bar can be formed on the front surface to hold lids open. Patients with a lens handling problem when extended wear would be inappropriate. As gas permeable materials are heat sensitive, the moulding of gas permeable scleral lenses is difficult. All gas permeable scleral lenses fitted and depicted in this program were lathe turned from a button of material from the Boston 2, Boston 4 and the Boston Equilens supplied by Polymer Technology Corporation. The gas permeable scleral material comes in the form of a blank or rod ready to be turned on a lathe. The lens consists of an optical portion and a scleral portion and the fitting procedure is carried out in separate stages for each. The lens back optic details are obtained by using the FLOM lens technique, the fenestrated lens for optical measurement as described by Norman Beer. The FLOM lens is a lens of defined optic radius and optic diameter with a small one millimeter edge flange and a fenestration. By placing the FLOM lens on the eye, it is possible to establish the ideal lens-eye relationship for the corneal limbal part of the scleral lens. The ideal fit is one with an even corneal clearance, no corneal touch, and with a small arc-shaped air bubble at the limbus. Using the optimum FLOM lens fit, an over-refraction is taken and the resultant power is calculated. With a keratoconic eye, however, the technique for using the FLOM lens is different. The initial fitting FLOM lens will have a marked central area of corneal touch, depending on the degree of the cone. This is ignored at this stage. It must have a well-formed bubble at the limbus. When the lens is received from the laboratory, it will be necessary to modify the lens back optic radius to eliminate the contact of the cornea on the back surface of the lens. This is achieved by observing the amount of central lens touch and then grinding out that area using a diamond coated tool. The grinding tool used must have a steeper lens radius than the back optic radius of the lens as established from the FLOM lens. It is recommended that a curve 0.75 millimeters steeper than the back optic radius be ground to the diameter of the area of central touch as noted when the lens has been placed in the eye. When the lens is now placed back onto the eye the area of corneal touch will be seen to be reduced. Repeat the grinding using progressively steeper tools by 0.75 of a millimeter until corneal touch is eliminated and an alignment of the cornea to the lens back surface is obtained. It is important that an air bubble remains at the limbus at all times. The effect of grinding the back surface adds minus power to the final lens. It is recommended to allow an extra plus three diopters to the lens power ordered when fitting a keratoconic eye to allow for the power change caused by the central lens grinding. The scleral fit is established with the aid of a scleral fitting set. A recommended set would consist of three lenses with radii of 13.5, 13.75 and 14 millimeters and an overall diameter of 24 millimeters. The lenses have a steep central radius to ensure total corneal clearance so that the scleral fit only can be evaluated. The optimum scleral fit is one that has a balanced and even bearing surface over the entire scleral surface. The fitting lens is inserted and gentle pressure applied to the lens as the patient looks in all primary directions. Any marked areas of localized contact will necessitate an alteration of the trial scleral lens radius. Once the scleral radius has been established, the correct overall diameter is determined. With the patient looking nasally in the extreme gaze, any displacement of the lens means that the lens diameter is too large and a smaller lens diameter is needed. In 98% of all patients, a radius of 14 millimeters has been found to be used. The most common lens diameter for adults has been found to be 23 millimeters whilst the majority of children are 20 millimeters and babies from 14 millimeters. All scleral lenses have a wide transition curve between the back optic radius and the scleral radius. 
The transition is normally 2 mm wide and has a curve of 4 mm flatter than the back optic radius. Gas permeable lenses are becoming available with extremely high DK values, but it is believed that it will still be necessary to fenestrate scleral lenses because of the suction effect of a sealed scleral lens. Three evenly spaced fenestrations at the limbal position are recommended. It is important that clean holes are drilled and that the edges are countersunk and well rounded and polished. These fenestrations are normally done in the laboratory in a standard position. The lens ordered from the laboratory includes the following parameters. Scleral radius, overall lens diameter, optic radius, optic diameter and the lens power. Apart from the keratoconic eye, it is generally possible to establish lens fit at the first visit, modify power and adjust lens clearance at the second visit and give the patient lens handling instructions at the third. Adaption to all day wear can be achieved within one week. The fitting of gas permeable scleral lenses to a keratoconic eye is somewhat more protracted, especially those with marked or decentered cones. The number of visits may vary from 6 to 15 visits to achieve an acceptable lens fit. However, this is considerably less time than the comparable fitting of a PMMA scleral lens. Up until June 1991, over 600 eyes had been fitted with gas permeable scleral lenses at this Western Australian practice, with a success rate of at least 98%. All failures have been patients with advanced keratoconus. In some cases, the gas permeable scleral lens provided a result that would not have been possible with any other type of contact lens. We should stress the importance and practicality for the practitioner being able to carry out lens modifications in his practice. The technique is not difficult and the equipment not expensive. With a little experience, the practitioner will be able to interpret the lens modifications required and to affect these accurately, especially necessary with a keratoconic cornea. It is not difficult to learn or do. The necessary modification equipment required consists of a set of grinding tools, preferably diamond coated as they maintain their curvatures, and their corresponding polishing tools, a vertical spindle and a dental type handpiece drill. A lens polishing machine would save time and ensure well polished lenses.
The gas permeable scleral lens is an advance for the contact lens practitioner and for his patient. For the practitioner, the lens is very much easier and quicker to fit. And for the patient, the lens is a more comfortable and acceptable lens to wear than the PMMA scleral lens. These factors suggest that the scleral lens will once again be readily available for those patients for whom it remains the lens of choice. The, the introduction of the gas term material to make a scleral lens is wrong. The worldwide availability of patients for today is what's so called modern scleral lens. All these lenses, the modern lenses, are sealed. But the question is, can we fit a better gas perm scleral lens for our patients? And the question also is, is oxygen permeability the only factor for a healthy scleral lens wear? Um, what happens to the debris behind the lens? And the question again, is the placing of a sealed lens on a cornea a healthy option? That's a good question. And I'll just run through some of the from papers from eminent uh, practitioners um, with sealed lenses. Can we quantify the fogging? And the debris often accumulates under the lens. It's a sealed lens. Endothelial blebs uh, occur sh shortly after the lens is fitted, creating hypoxic stress. Leukocytes in the post-tear lens film. Leukocytes suggest infection. Negative pressure systems resulting in a suction force lens on the eye. It's a sealed lens. The increased intraocular pressure by up to five milligrams after four hours wear. A sealed lens is uh, the oxygen, the tear interchange exchange is less than 2% with a sealed lens. But there's, we're getting excellent results for them with a sealed lens, the modern scleral uh, contact lens, gas perm scleral contact lens. Can we do better for our patients? Is a, is a fenestrated lens a better option? Now, initially, uh, this was described by Norman Beer and Joseph Dallas. This is uh, a, um, a slide I've, that Norman Beer put out. He was the first to develop with, uh, with Dallas, but Norman actually Painted the lens, painted the uh, the uh, fenestrated scleral lens, um, and this is the from lens exactly as you saw on the video. We've got a little air bubble, and it's such a good system because when I learned in Australia how to fit the lens, it took a K reading, went point seven millimeters flatter, and that was the back optic radius. With this from design, when you can vary the the radius and you can vary the uh, the overall diameter and the corneal radius, you, if you've got a spherical cornea, you can virtually get the perfect end result with that little bubble. Push gently onto the eye, the bubble will go and it will come back. That's the perfect lens fit. Now, that was a, uh, that's, uh, this is the system I used. We actually developed a, uh, a keratoconic flom lens, fenestrated lens for optical measurement, where the, 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 uh, a conical back surface was a radius was on the back surface of back of the back surface of the lens. The whole series of lenses, so it really it reduced the number of modifications one had to, to, do, to do. Now the fitting change from a with a gas perm essentially moves from a, a glove fit with a seal lens to a, an entirely non-suction lens, and this is to, this I think is a huge advantage. Um, the seal lens must avoid a bubble. An air bubble is important with a fenestrated lens. So we need an air bubble. And the beauty of it is every time you blink, the lid pushes the, the lens back on the eye and you've got this pumping action. So you get a, a continual interchange of tears. If you get any debris on the lens, you've got a blocked or a, uh, you've got some rubbish in the fenestration. Easy to clean out without uh, uh, disturbing the the fenestrator. We, very, very clinically, I just got a toothbrush, moisten the end of it, gently push it through the lens, blow through it, you've got a clean lens, a, a clean fenestration. 
But the pumping action, I think, is very important because not only are you, you, you're getting a, a, a constant interchange of tears, nice flushing of fresh oxygen to the, uh, to the lens, to the cornea, and flushing out any debris that should be there. The, the, it's very important. The, the, this limbal area is very, very important. The, 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 the limbus has got to be clear of any, any pressure or any, any contact. You've got a nice little uh, junction there and you get a nice interchange of tears all the way around. So that's, I think it's very, very important. Uh, I never, never fitted a seal lens. I've only fitted fenestrated lenses and I have done for, do I dare say, 35, nearly 40 years. Uh, and I've seen patients who are due to have corneal grafts, fitted with the lens, they come back every year. If they're an adult, you can just polish the lens. The lens will last, not good for business, but the lens will last for many, many years. Um, when you fit a lens, and this is Dallas's teaching, the largest bearing surface possible. The more bearing on, the, on that intensive sclera, lift it off the cornea, it's just great. Um, a very comfortable lens, even weight distribution and stable and comfortable. Now, this is a, uh, when, uh, a classic case where you need a very, very large lens. This lady has got uh, that top lid's not working. So we made a lens here and it's got a little ledge on it to hold the top, to hold the lid away. But you needed a large lens because you've got to anchor the bottom of the lens and the lower, lower sulcus so that the, the, the lens sits there and, and the ledge is effective. If you have a small lens, the lid will just push it down. So that's the, the result. Uh, doesn't look so good, but you can see uh, a large bearing lens, the better. The other advantage of a fenestrate lens is you don't have to fill it, fill it with solution before you insert it. You just wet the lens as you do with a normal cornea lens, slip it in, pull the bottom of it down, nothing, nothing more to do. Um, that's really very, very easy. As, uh, particularly for babies, babies and old people, you know, you can just get the patient, put your hand on the forehead, lift the top lid away and uh, slip the lens in. Easy. And it's easy to teach uh, parents how to do it. Uh, they're the most important thing with, with paediatrics. They've got to do the hard work. This is a little old lady with, with arthritis. You see the poor old hands. Um, she could actually insert and remove the lens. If it was sealed, I think she'd have it. It would be difficult. But with uh, a fenestrated lens, it's easy. The disadvantage of, of, a, of fitting a, a fenestrated lens, it's not difficult to fit. Basically, everything you saw in that video is basic, gets back to basics. You know, you've got touch areas, you've got to relieve the touch. Um, on the corneal part, you, you put the a lens on, you push gently on the, back on the, on the eye, you'll see the areas of touch. And if just if you remember that area of touch, you go out to your little workshop, you've got a series of diamond-coated tools, you just moisten the lens, put it on the tool where you get the same area of touch, grind away. And just do that till you get a perfect fit. It's not that it will do. It takes a little bit of time, but just like going to a tailor, you'll do it perfectly. Um, and it's not like a, a disposable lens. It's a custom-made lens. Um, now, technology has changed. And with the changes, it makes it easier. With the eye print technology, it's very interesting how um, Christine uh, Sint and Keith Parker at um, uh, I print prosthetic technologies, they have developed a system where you can actually take an impression of an eye without using an anesthetic. Very, very good, very neat. Christine developed that. Um, and the reason she did it, uh, she went to that way, is that a lot of countries do not let uh, practitioners uh, only let medicos take a, put an anesthetic in the eye. Whereas this, with this system, you can take an impression of an eye and then um, and then that's eye print prosthetics. Uh, advanced vision technology is the lab that makes them, and you get a perfect impression of an eye. Perfect. And we've had them, you know, uh, they've actually come out to Perth um, and did a, did a lecture for me. For me. Uh, it doesn't hurt the patient at all. The cornea is quite healthy. And now they've then worked out a very good system 
where they can scan the impression. So they get a per they've now got a perfect uh, front surface of the core of the of the eye looking at them, and from that they can then dis uh, design a lens to to fit. Now the beauty with, with this sort of system, they've they've actually done all the hard work. You know, instead of grinding out the lens like I had to do, you've got a picture here. You can fit the lens exactly the way you want it. All you have to do is put a nice big wide transition though at the limbus, put your fenestrations there. And you've got a penetrated lens. So all the hard work that I was doing is now very straightforward. The other technology that I, there may be more, but these are the two that I know of, later, the latitude lens. They don't take an impression of the eye. They've got a method to scan the eye. So when, once they scan the eye, they've got exactly what, uh, or similar to what uh, uh, Christine Sis done, taking a mole of an eye, um, but you've got a scan of the eye. Again, like the, uh, excuse me, I'll just go back one. Like you've got, you've got the scan of the eye and you can then, it's still going to be so straightforward. Put a, a, a limbal clearance, put your fenestrations there. You've got a, you've got a fenestrated lens. And that's the a profile of a, of a latitude lens. It's all bumpy and everything. Um, in, our, in my day, we had any spherical um, lenses for the, uh, to make for the squirrel. But, you know, it's not a glove fit, uh, the, the lens that we're making. It's the loose-fitting lens. As, you know, it does, it's not sort of it's not suction on the eye. It's, it's moving. Every time the patient blinks, the little pump axe works. The tears get into change. Uh, but that's the, in today's technology, you can actually fit it precisely. The fitting of the lens is straightforward. And the benefit of fenestration for me, and I, you know, so I've done this for probably 40 plus years, you just don't get problems. You know, once you've got it right, uh, and it's not rocket science to get right, it's just a matter of looking and doing whatever modification you need. You get a pumping action, great interchange of tears, fresh oxygen to the cornea, no rubbish under the lens, all the debris is, is, is eliminated. It's, it's pretty, pretty straight. You don't get any fogging, you don't get deposits, you don't have to fill the lens with solution before you put it in. You don't have fancy ways of doing it. You just wash it, slip it in, and you get it out the same way as you get a, 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 a corneal lens out. Dallas had a way of taking the scleral lens out by just putting his finger on the lens, slipping it up, hooking the, the nail on the top of it, and lifting it out. But the way we do it with a, a corneal lens, it's very, very straightforward. It's not a glove fit lens. I think that's important. It's not a sealed glove fit lens. You don't get edema. You don't get, as long as you've got good limbal clearance, which you must have, uh, often with a seal lens, it's really sitting really right onto the limbus. With these, it's a big lens. You've got plenty of clearance and you don't get prescribation. So the question is, is a seal gas peripheral scleral lens a healthy option for our patients? Now, can we, and can we provide a better scleral lens for our patients? And the question I'll leave you with is a fenestrated scleral lens a healthier long term option for our patients? Thank you, and uh, happy to answer any questions if you, if you like. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I think the, the presentation itself shows uh, your love for fenestration. I think, as you said, you never fitted a steel lens. You, all your patients that you have you. fitted with uh, fenestrated lens. So yeah. that, that, that all uh, says it true. Thank yeah. you so much. A pleasure. More than a pleasure. I hope, I hope it's been informative. And one yes. thing I, I didn't mention, um, all practices are really at the front line the front face of, the, of, of, of the patient fitting. And you can see what doesn't work. And you can see, if you stand back, you can probably see what improvements we could make to fit any contact lens. You're at the front, at, at the cold face, as they say. So if you have an idea, you should just go to a, your, your contact lens laboratory and say, I've got this idea. Would you make it for me? Um, if they don't make it, find another laboratory because 
that's how we learn and that's how we improve. So we depend on all practices to observe and dream and make, uh, make the suggestions because we can always do better. That's right. Yeah. So thank you so much again for sharing that. One question again, which came up uh, very early on asking about, uh, was there any particular patient or case where fenestrated did not really work? I mean, it came on earlier, uh, but I just thought I'll ask you because I your presentation, uh, you told us that you didn't fit any non-fenestrated one, but any patient... Mm -hmm. You came across that it didn't work. Maybe you fitted a corneal GP or probably didn't fit a lens. Was there any such case? Uh, sorry, I'm just sharing the screen. Am I doing the wrong thing? No, no, we can. It's okay. We'll be able to. No, no. I think I think you can fit anybody with a squirrel in. Anybody. And the, the worse the case, the, the better the result. Now, it's, it's a very satisfying experience to have patients crying in your, in your practice. You know, I see parents crying, the children crying, or the patient crying. I'm crying. <laughs> it's just so nice. That's what we're about. We're in the seeing business. Uh, I think with a, with a squirrel lens, you can fit anybody. I just think I don't like the idea of a seal lens. I may be wrong, but I don't like the idea. Okay. Um, I, don't, I think it's, it's wrong to have a, a sealed uh, you seal the, the, the front, end, front surface of the cornea. Um, when you can, there are ways to not seal it, to have a lens that's not a glove fit, a sealed lens. Uh, you've got a nice pumping action, takes a little bit more work, but with a new technology, all the hard work's taken out. All you've got to do is, you know, have a scanner or take an impression. But these are available. And uh, believe me, once you do these sort of, and you're, I found that once I started, providing a service for pa for, to patients who couldn't see, ophthalmologists loved it because here they're getting these patients, they don't know what to do with them. Great, mm. they refer them to me. I've got the problem. And being isolated, I've got no one to, to talk to. We had to work it out. And if you always go back to basics, you can work things out. It really is, as I keep showing that slide, it's not rocket science. It's really a matter of application. Awesome, awesome. And one question, again, this is very practical, I would say, is, uh, you know, we don't have these tools and technologies. Uh, I mean, you did mention it's not a big investment. It's just a small drill hole mm. machine and all of that. Uh, but uh, do you think that there are certain trial lenses sets which are available with standard fenestration? Should we be yeah. using them for diagnostic fitting? Or sure. the fenestrations are done after we fit the seal lens and then fenestrate them. No. What the fenestration now is done, it will be done in the laboratory. They fenestrate, they polish the earth, countersink, all should be done per perfectly. Um, I, think, I think if we really look ahead, um, the way I did it is pretty straightforward. It's basic stuff. But if you can... Go, go into a system where they, they scan the eye or take an impression of the eye or scan the eye, the hard work's done for you. All the hard work's done. All you need to do is put a lens on, even a corneal lens, with, uh, take a re over refraction, give the details to the laboratory, and they should be able to calculate the front surface power. But the back surface, which is the fitting one, should be straightforward. You know, you, you take an uh, uh, you take. Uh, the impression of the eye, which I think is the best way because you get a, you can go really a long way out. I think with scanning, you've got to get the patient to look in various directions and then they, they have a, a program which amalgamates into one. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. The one where you take an impression of the eye, probably because I'm more familiar with that, is, uh, it works. They've done the hard work for you. They put it, they've scanned the, the impression, it goes up on the screen, there's your eye. Right. Then you they say, right, what do I put on it to get the result? They, they do it. They put the, the nimble uh, clearance. They'll fenestrate. They shouldn't have much to do. To, they should have nothing to do. It should all work out. Okay. So the bottom line is we do the trial fitting as we are doing the diagnostic fit. And after we achieve a proper optimum fitting, we then fenestrate the lens. No, no, no. no? The lens will be fenestrated in the, in the laboratory. In what the lab, order? Yeah. They do everything because if you have a seal lens, it'll look different 
to a fenestrated lens because one's a loose fitting and one's a seal fitting. So once you loosen it up by having a nice transition of the, of the limbus, it's not going to be so. Uh, it's not going to be the same fit. Okay. So you do the you if you can scan or take an impression. That's the future of it, I think. And there is an investment to do it. I, I'm sure. But once you do the first patient, send it back to the doctor, you'll be flooded. There's a lot of patients out there that need it. They do need it. I had a very busy practice doing contact contact lenses. Um, I was lucky to have a uh, making my own lenses. I could try anything. I could go down to the lab and say, look, this is what we want, we want to do. And, uh, for example, we, we've, I've developed a soft translating bifocal. And, you know, I'd put it in the eye. It didn't work. I'd go down and say, well, this is one thing Dallas taught me. If ever you have an idea, uh, say you want to have an idea of an of a, of a X lens, um, try it. If it doesn't work, you've got to change something. So change something, but not a little bit. Change it quite a big bit, like with a translating bifocal. I put it on. It doesn't translate. What do I do differently? Do I increase the, 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 tra the, the ledge on the bottom? Do I make it looser? Just change it a long way. And you've either gone the right way which is fine, then you'll just come back to make it comfortable or make it do exactly what you want. We've gone the wrong way. Then you go the other way. Uh, yeah. And it really is basic when you think about it. Um, and that's Dallas. I learned a lot from Dallas. He was a good teacher. <laughs> that's right. So probably that's the reason you mentioned in the video, I think it would take a couple of visits to get to a final fit because the fit may change. And once you put the penetrations and all that, you want to achieve yeah. the... The good fit, right? Could well the, the new technology when they have a scan of the eye or an impression of an eye which they then scan, you've then got your eye looking at me at you without yeah, you know, and then you could design the lens to go on top. The laboratory should do that for you. So, so you put your power on the front surface, and a nice transition, and penetrate. Now the lens will drop back on the eye, so the lab will have to allow clearance. Uh, make it a little bit steeper in the, in the center so when it drops back it'll be the perfect fit that's just a matter of them working out it should be so easy to do gosh i was in the wrong generation i should have been born now and started with an england it's so easy yeah. <laughs> i think it is anyway it's relatively easy now it can be easy okay great and uh, the other question is uh, what about the breakage or handling are fenestrated lenses uh, easier to break? Is there something which you would like to comment on this uh, one? Not really. I, uh, I'm not familiar with seal lenses. But yeah. penetrated lenses don't break. Unless you do something, drop it or, you know, it, sh it just shouldn't break. Um, I guess it depends. When you fenestrate the lens, you've got to fenestrate it very carefully. If, you know, you mustn't fracture that. Uh, you must round the edges very well. It's all basic. A lab should do it. I mean, it's basic common sense. You don't say that a lens has got sharp edges. Um, but I don't. I had very little breakage problem, if any at all. You know, it's usually caused by the patient doing something that they shouldn't have been doing. Okay, great. So, uh, in fact, hmm. sorry, I, I, one of those uh, keratoconic patients I showed you, he was in going for a corneal graft. He came, you know, not referred to me, or came, somehow got to me on the grapevine. And uh, I fit him with a lens, and 10 years later, he had the same lens. He'd come in every year and we'd polish it. Mm. Same lens. Not good for business, but good for the patient. And that's what we're there for. That's right. Yeah. And again, I think you covered this point in, in your talk and your presentation uh, about debris. And the, uh, you know the, the exchange yeah. here, exchange and less debris. So fenestrated lens allows very little debris or no debris. That's why it's much more easier, isn't it? If you get debris, it will mean that the, there's a problem at the fenestration. It's either not countersunk well, it's, an, it's nice and smooth, or it hasn't been cleaned properly. You know, there's a buildup of debris because every time they blink, you should have a nice clean splashing action. Yes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, very, very high-tech cleaning the penetrations. Just, just get a soft uh, toothbrush, on, just gently push it through the lens from the inside, blow through it, you don't have a block lens okay. penetration. The penetrations are not that small, 
I think they're from memory 0.5 and half a millimeter. They're really a reasonable size. They're not the very fine ones. Uh, you don't, we don't have, if you have a problem, it's the, the, pen, the penetrations are not very good or they're blocked. Okay. So ideally, you would advise patients to clean the fenestration. Yeah, brush every, they take it, take it out at night. You clean it with a, a corneal lens or contact lens cleaning solution. Yeah. Rinse it off. Press it, press through the with your toothbrush. Blow through it. Rinse it again. Soak it overnight. Okay. Okay. So that's probably something which we have to convey to our patients that not only clean the front surface and back surface, yes. but make sure that your fenestrations Absolutely. are cleaned and not blocked, right? It's a routine. Every time you take your lens out, you do it. If you say okay. do it once a week, they'll forget. Do it every night. Hmm. No okay. problem. Yeah. And uh, what about patients with dry eye? Any additional benefits for patients oh. who have dry eye with fenestrated lenses? Well, the, the, you've got a lens, you've got a tear layer, and you've got a replacement tear layer. So it's, it's, we found it very, 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 we found it works for everybody, <laughs> everything. I'm, not, I'm simplifying it, but we had, we had dry eye patients, we fenestrated the lens. Um, you've got a constant interchange. Look, they may not have a lot of tear, but they've got enough tear. Okay. Yeah, pro I think probably this question might uh, come from, we learn that, you know, when we have a seal lens and we have a dry eye patient, we normally fill the bowl with, uh, you know, autologous serum sure. drops yeah. or, you know, artificial drop, which can bring in yeah. comfort. But yeah, we, we also learn that when we have fenestrated lens, we no need to fill uh, any solution. So mm. probably that thought would have aggravated. Is there fenestrated better or non-fenestrated better for dry eye patients? Well, I think it's better because you've got natural tears on the right. cornea. You haven't got anything artificial you know, involved. So, uh, yeah, from my experience, well, we're fitting all sorts of patients with, with penetrated lenses, getting results. It, uh, it was really, and once you do, as I said, the first patient, once you fit the first patient, the word will get around and you'll be so busy, you wonder how you managed before. Great. And I think one question, which is the number of fenestrations. So I, I, I do understand that you talked about three fenestration yeah, uh, yeah. equidistance on the limbal zone that side. But do you think we can increase the number of fenestrations or decrease it based on the case or condition? Is there some rule or logic behind it? I think one thing, see, when I fitted the lens, it was a, it was a round lens. It wasn't actually a glove fit to fit the, the eye. Um, I guess if I took a, a mole of an eye, I could then do it and do it with only one fenestration because it's important to have a fenestration in the limbal area, in the, in the open eye. So we put three, because the lens could rotate and to ensure there's always one fenestration in the op optical aperture, we put three lens, three, uh, three fenestrations. So always there's one of the lens, one fenestration in the optical aperture. Now, with the taking a mold of the eye or scan of the eye, you probably only need one fenestration. And that, as long as that fenestration is in the outside, um, uh, just the one in the outside corner, uh, at, the edge of the, uh, at the edge of the pupil area, you've got it, in the, in the level area. In fact, when I was working with Dallas, he was taking impressions on the eye or using a, an eye that, that was interesting. He was the first to learn to take an impression of a human eye. And again, tell me if I'm boring you. <laughs> I asked him, how did you find that out? He had a sister that was a, uh, a uh, oh, what's the right word? She was taking impressions of mummies. And um, there's a word to describe what she did. He said, you take an impression of the mummy and not disturb the mummy. So he was using the same system. He practiced on his own eye <laughs> until he got it right. Um, but if you do that, like taking a scan of the eye, you've got an eye looking at you. So that lens didn't rotate. So he only had one fenestration on the, out on the outside in the limbal area. But because my lenses, the, the lens we use, could rotate to ensure one fenestration was always in the, in the open area of the, of the eye, we put three in. So you don't need more. 
As long as you have one, it'll work. It's got to be in the right spot. Yeah, great. And uh, one question again. I think uh, probably we we did discuss this, but I thought we just take this up. Is can we usually fit our normal uh, lenses and ask lab to do the fenestrations when we order the lens? Do you think that works most of the time, or it will take us some time to re- regain that new fit? I think it will take time because, um, I, because the the seal lens is only a very small lens. Yeah. Um, so even if I say a 16 millimeter lens, uh, you're going to fit the optic, which is probably say say it's 14 millimeter, 13.5. You then have to have a wide liberal clearance. So 13.5 will make it 14. Say so millimeter clearance, you've only got one millimeter on the square, which I you know with my teaching and my what I was following doing Dallas teaching, the bigger the better. The more bearing on the scura, the more comfortable then. Big clear, big clearance on the level. That's the most important clearance area. Um, I think if you fenestrate, get your lab to fenestrate in the limbal area, you'll get a totally different fit. Um, yeah. And keep in mind, the fenestrate is half a millimetre. So you're not going to have much room uh, to do it. So I don't think it'll work, actually, to be honest with you. I don't think you'll get a good result. Maybe... Next time you have a lens that needs replacing, uh, changing the power, change the power, and then one you've got left, send it back to the lab and get it to fenestrate. See what happens. I don't think it'll, you'll get a totally different fit. Yeah. Because if you fenestrate, you haven't got to seal anymore. No, the solution will just come out. And it'll, it'll, I think it'll drop back onto the eye. Yeah. I don't think it'll work. But worth trying. You can only, you've got to try these things. Yeah. So the reason behind asking this question, I thought you will give us some magic number. You know, for example, if a seal lens sag was 42 and I want to order a fenestrated, can I straight away order a 45? You know, that's you something like a magic number. But do we have such magic number? I don't know. You could try. That's the only <laughs> way you'll find out. <laughs> but okay. I don't know if it'll work because you really haven't got enough skir- on the skewer yeah. to, to hold the lens to lift it off the cornea. That's okay. the key. You've got That's to know. The, a seal lens is a seal lens. It's a totally different lens when you fenestrate. I see. Okay. But who am I to say, no, you've got to try. You've got to Good. try. Let me know how you go. <laughs> awesome. Great. So I think I think the, the, the main point here you'd like to make is if you want to prescribe a fenestrated lens, you have to fit a fenestrated lens to get the fitting and yeah. order penetrated lens. You can't so. play around with a C lens and no, then, no. right? Yeah. And, and the laboratory that will, will work out because when you penetrate, the lens will drop back on the eye. Okay? So they'll have to allow central clearance to do it and they'll, they should be able to work it out. That's great. Right. And let's take one last question before uh, you know we wrap up for today. This is, uh, I'll just read that out for you. It we all understand the advantages now of fenestrated lenses and the complications such as midday fogging uh, have been reduced because of the fenestrations and the expenses. I think for inpatients, view the expenses uh, regarding the fill- filling solution also uh, minimizes because we are giving the fill, uh, you know, fenestrated lens. Yeah. Uh, when do we see for all fits to be best? When it comes to fenestrated lenses, I think you have answered this that all people can be fitted with fenestrated yeah. lenses. There's yeah. not much. Uh, I think, I think it, what needs to happen is a group of, of practitioners uh, start fitting fenestrated lenses. The problem is, all these, you know, I'm very, I'm not very happy with multinationals. <laughs> I've been screwed so many times because often money is the most important thing. And most of these laboratories now have a lens, a sealed lens, a modern scleral lens. So for them to change, the pressure's got to come from the practitioner to want a better, a better fitting lens. So when do we see the all fits? It'll take time. I think you'll need the practitioners to start fitting uh, the fenestrated lenses and to get the results and prove the results, and it'll be easy. Once, it, once you've worked, got the system worked out, then I think everyone will go to fenestrated because it's just a healthier result, much healthier. You know, I can just talk from experience. I've never fitted a seal lens, but I've seen results uh, and the questions 
I get this, I get that. What do I do next? It shouldn't happen. It's like so I can't answer the question. Um, <laughs> I wish, you know, Ezekiel was a great prophet, but I'm not a great prophet. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I think, again, this question comes with a thought process that, you know, scleral lenses were there way beyond 30, 40 years. And they were not so popular for some time. And then now scleral lenses are gaining popularity. Yeah. So we want to know when fenestrated scleral lens will get popularity. What's the 4C or so, forecast in the next five years or 10 years? That's what I think okay. we are tend to like to know. The answer will be, it depends. depends yeah. <laughs> That's as close as I can get. Okay. But uh, I think once there are people that are starting to, to fenestrate, and I think the more people that do, and, and see how the results uh, are so good that it will be the, the norm. Because with the systems or the scanning systems today, it should be so straightforward, so straightforward. Yeah. I wish I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> and I think I'm not know. so. I wish I, you notice in that video, I had hair in those days, a little bit more, but not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so. So that's that's uh, really uh, kind of you to let us know your experience. I think with that, I would like to thank you for sharing the, your expertise, your time uh, with us and taking us through. I think uh, really informative and some messages messages have already uh, you know started coming on the chat uh, saying thank you and oh, uh, nice. appreciate uh, your time and your uh, you know sharing with us today. More than a pleasure, and uh, I hope it's been productive and uh, something you think about. Definitely, yes. Uh, we do have a session planned next weekend. Uh, it's again on scleral lenses and uh, the speaker is going to take us through some case studies. Take care, everyone. Be safe. I will see you next weekend. Until then, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Bye. Pleasure. More than a pleasure. Have a great evening. Yeah. Thank you.